let's make a custom neon lamp. And this was inspired by a friend posting a picture of some old glass Edison screw fuses. And he joked, these must be the newfangled neon lamps that the youngsters are all into. And I thought, you know, I, I knew it was a fuse, but I just thought that'd be quite nice to actually make a custom neon lamp by with the using a custom cover onto an existing Edison screw base that I have salvaged off a decapitated LED lamp. So here's what we're going to do. I have a neon indicator lamp and I'm going to solder two resistors onto the leads. And I'm going to keep them nice and long because one of them will be going through the end of this cap and the other will be going onto the side. And I'm going to solder it onto the side. I've already pre-tinned this as a precaution, um, just in case it didn't tin during the video. But the other option is to, to fold the lead over. And at the end, we're going to jam this into it. And that would effectively jam that lead against the side. So let's start. So initially, I need to get a height. I want the neon lamp to be roughly central to this. So if I hold this in place here, I'm looking for, oop, looking for the wire to put it down to about here. I shall zoom down this. This would be a good idea. Then we can see better. So I would say that when I add the resistor on, Okay, I've got a rough idea of what I want here. So I'm going to crop the neon leads. Fortunately, it's quite long. So uh, I'm going to crop these relatively long, about, say, 15 millimetre, just over half an inch. And I'm going to clamp it in between the jaws of the helping hands. Uh, this is a bit of silicon sleeving in the jaws just to protect the lamp and make it grip better. Otherwise, they tend to ping out. And then I'm going to leave this fairly long, actually. So I shall cut this one at about the same length. Now, the choice of resistor, technically speaking for a neon, in the UK and other uh, similar voltage countries, like 100, uh, 220 to 240 volt, they do recommend somewhere between 100k to 220k. You can go higher if you wish, but it will get progressively dimmer, and it may start going unstable and flickering, which isn't a bad effect. In, in America, you or other 120 volt countries you'd use about 39k typically so maybe two 22k resistors i'm using two 100k resistors just because uh it seems like a good idea it's not going to push the lamp too hard and therefore it's going to last for ages if they overrun me in lamps they don't last as long i should tin this before i try soldering it on i should tin both of them and then I shall apply that to that and flow it. Nice. Nice. And now I shall tin this one as well. Ideally, it would be quite nice to flow the solder as you join the leads together, but I'm tinning them both so that theoretically the flux isn't so important because they're both tinned already. Except it does leave that big tail, usually, of soda. But that's all right, it's fine. It's worked perfectly. Right, now I'm going to see if I've actually got this right. So it's going in about there. The lamp base is there. Yes, that's pretty good, actually. Okay, I'm going to cut both resistors at round about the same height now. So that resistor is going to poke out the bottom of that. Right, okay. Actually, I may crop it off. Once I poked it out the bottom, yes, I'll do that. So I'm going to put some heat shrink sleeving over this now to cover up to about there. So I shall cut two identical pieces of sleeving. I'll just make them both identical, even though they're not going to the same place. If you're making one of these with a um, bayonet cap lamp holder, you would just leave them both the identical length and they'd both go out at the same place at the bottom to one contact each. Double check it, I'm in shot. Yes, I am in shot. This is good. And now I shall heat shrink these on using the heat gun that is a part of my now ancient Yahua 87860D Chinese soldering station. It's a useful tool, great for doing heat shrink and also suitable for reflowing soda, which is ultimately its primary use. But uh, I find I use it more for heat shrink and stuff like that. More because I don't do a huge amount of 
surface mount stuff, owing to the fact it's so tiny. But I'm doing more and more these days because ultimately you don't have any choice, do you? Things are going firmly in the surface mount component direction. Now this is a little rivet pushed in the bottom to trap the wire. So if you go inside and push the rivet out or prise it out from the bottom, then it will release that wire and you can then stuff your own wire in there instead. This ain't working too well, there it is. It's like one of those rivets you get that put your buttons in your jeans. And now I'm going to fold one of these leads up. I'm going to push the other one down there. Through that hole at the bottom. And uh, you know what? I'm going to fold it over. So I shall just gently crop this a bit and then fold it over because it's kind of designed to do that. It goes into the recess here and then when you put this rivet back in, it blocks it into place when you can actually pick the rivet up without fumbling it. So now when I push that rivet in, that is that connection made and it's locked in place. Excellent. Now I'm going to solder this other lead by keeping the other one well out of the way. I'm going to bend this one round, crop it down and solder it onto the side. So I'll flow some solder onto this and then attempt to hold the lamp cap here while it gets progressively hotter and hotter as I melt the solder. This could be the fumbliest bit. This is where, as I say, the wire could just have been folded over the top, but I didn't. So I've got that pre-melted blob of solder. I've tested this metal. It is steel. A magnet sticks to it. So I have melted that. The wire has gone onto the solder. And now I'm going to fold that down inside and then get this neon at round about the height that I want it. There is a bit of leeway here, which is quite nice. Maybe a bit lower. And then, using the heat gun again, because this is quite a handy way to do it, when you get these uh, lamp covers, when you salvage them off an existing lamp, it's basically the lamp's been put in, and then they've got a tool that they pull a handle around, and lots of pins go in, and it crimps it into the lamp holder. The easiest way I've found of uh, getting the basin is, since it's uh, quite thermally sensitive, Oh, I'll have to just cause a little avalanche of stuff here. Uh, I just uh, soften it with a heat gun. Watch me go overboard and over soften it. This is PLA, incidentally. Now, there's no STL file for this. Instead, down in the description, you will find a file, uh, a script called an OpenSCAD script. And the thing about the OpenSCAD script is that you can customise it and then create your STL file by building it you'll very quickly get the hang of it. This has gone very soft, way too soft, not to worry. Uh, that's fine. I'll get this lamp where I want it and then just wiggle this in. Oh, that is way too soft. Maybe I've even shrunk it down a bit. If that happens, you can add glue. Now here's a, a thing, right? The OpenSCAD file is one that I also used for making lamp covers. Oh, the closest lamp cover I've got is actually not one of these, but it's uh, it was shaped like this. But uh, it's designed for making big diamond shaped lamp covers that go on to go on to existing uh, hacked lamps that the resistors have been changed in, so they run at much lower power and therefore don't melt the plastic. So that script, uh, it turns out it's suitable for making these crystals in a size that can go into these as well. If you set it for about 25 millimeters. Um, the nice thing about the script is you can also scale the diamond up or down. Uh, here's one I made earlier. Well, actually, a couple I made earlier. The, these are the prototypes. Um, so this was a smaller one. That was a bigger one. But you could scale it even bigger if you wanted. Although, keep in mind, this is a quite low-intensity light. Um, but the nice thing you, with that script, you can also extend it longer if you wish, just by changing a few variables. Then once you've done it, you print the script. Now, here's a question. If you're familiar with 3D printing, I'm using an FL Sun... Q5. And when it gets the tips of these, uh, as it gets narrower, it tends to go a bit frostier. Not sure why that is. It's nice and clear down here with the clear PLA, but it gets frostier as it gets up to the end. Anyway, 
I'm going to let this one cool down. I think I'm going to have to add glue to that one. So instead, I shall show you one of the ones I made earlier. Just like Blue Peter, which was a kids' TV show in the, the UK where they made things live and then said, here's one we made earlier. So I'll screw it in. And it just glows very gently in there. Oh, it's got a bit of instability. Oh, that's the camera frame rate catching the flicker. Right, tell you what, I'm going to take the exposure off. And then I'm going to turn the light off and you shall see it as it is. A very gentle neon glow. It'd be quite nice as a nightlight because it's just barely just glowing. Um, I'll put the smaller one in so you can see that as well. Maybe I could screw the other one in that I've made that haven't really glued the cover in yet. This one, also quite nice. It's not going to be super bright. It is just really designed for decorative use. Right, let's see if I can screw this one in. This is the one we've just made. Yeah, there it goes. You can experiment the position of the neon inside. Just bear in mind if you start pulling the cover off and before you've glued it, that that is kind of live in there. There's the neon glow itself, the two little electrodes glowing on me. Very nice. And at the current, I'm running these. I'm underrunning them deliberately. The neons will last for, well, decades. They last a very long time if you underrun them. But that is it. Uh, watch your eyes. The light is coming back. The light is back. So that's it. Really, it's just fundamentally how you can make unusual little decorative neon lamps that use virtually no power at all and will last almost indefinitely. It's quite a nice project. It's just novel. And another demonstration of something nice you can do with 3D printing. Another reason that you might consider one day buying a 3D printer. And I want to mention at this point in time that if you go online and you look at the 3D printer channels, they all make it look really complicated. It's not. It really isn't. If you're daunted by that, don't be daunted by it. Just buy yourself a cheap, popular printer. No need for tweaks or anything like that. Just start printing. And then as you go along, you might find you do want to tweak it. But off the shelf, you can usually get fairly acceptable results from it. So don't let those channels put you off. Uh, and that is it. A nice 3D printed neon lamp.